My name is Stephen Fong, and I'm the Web and Technology Manager at Inductive Automation. I work with a great group of developers and designers to build awesome customer-facing web pro uh, products like Inductive University, the new About Us section, and the new pricing page, and I'm uh, really glad to be here. When a uh, interface is poorly designed, they aren't just unpleasant to use, they're harder to master, they're less efficient, and they make their operators prone to mistakes. So let me show you an example of a kind of a poorly designed interface. So here we have an example of your typical just bad interface. It's kind of ugly, there's a lot going on, and there's some distracting elements there. There's an alarm state that's kind of difficult to read uh, as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to improve uh, this HMI today. And we'll do that by taking a two-pronged approach. Uh, first, we'll reduce the cognitive load of the interface by removing visual distractions and organizing things a little bit better. So the first major theme that we'll look at today is cognitive load. Cognitive load describes the effort required to create a mental map of how a system works. So kind of imagine your interface viewed from your user, and they're wondering, you know, what is the overall status of the system? Is everything okay? What is important for me to look at right now? How can I interact with the system? What am I supposed to do next? So uh, one way to uh, reduce cognitive load is to remove visual clutter. As I mentioned earlier, every visual element on uh, the interface adds to the overall cognitive load. So try to remove any extraneous information that doesn't actually help the user understand the data that, that, that's being presented to them. So going back to our example HMI, we can see that there are some issues with visual clutter. There's a distracting animation um, that doesn't really provide a whole lot of information in return. In this scenario, we have some extraneous elements that aren't critical to this view. So maybe we can save them for a different view. And there are also some other kind of distracting graphic choices, like the cutaway effect on the tanks, the way that the equipment is drawn, and the gradient effect on the pipes. So here's our first revision of that layout. And you see that we've re uh, removed the animation and a number of the elements that weren't critical for the operator to view. We've simplified the graphics and gotten rid of distracting elements like the shading and the cutaway effects. The result is something that is a lot simpler easier to read, and a lot more iconic. So our next principle is a pair, which is alignment and grids. Alignment um, makes different elements appear related to each other. So you see here that uh, we have some dots. And even though they're color coded, the dots on the left aren't really seen as two groups. It isn't until the, the, that they're brought into alignment that our brains perceive them as being related. Grids uh, add rhythm and order. They create a set of visual rules that form the backbone of your interface. Most people have become familiar with grid systems through newspapers and magazines, though they've been used in some form for hundreds of years. And they're useful because they serve as a background, uh, the, the backbone of your layout. Uh, they introduce your user to uniformity and familiarity with your interface. So even if they haven't seen a certain screen before, they, they'll know the visual rules and be able to anticipate where to find navigation, data, and imagery. These grids usually are divided into different columns. Columns of 2, 3, 4, 8, and 12 are most common. So you can see here that this magazine uses 10 columns that have been divided into two major text areas plus an extra area for a, a caption. The uh, BBC uses a common 12 column grid. Designers like 12 column grids because of their flexibility. They can be easily broken up into 2, 3, 4, or six column spans. And you can see here at the bottom that the featured content at the very bottom are actually composed of four columns each. If you're building for the web, you can speed up your development process with web frameworks like Foundation or Bootstrap that make it easier to develop web layouts using grids since they have all the, the uh, grid behavior kind of baked into the framework. At Inductive Automation, we use the uh, Foundation framework. So back to our example screen, we've gone with a 12 column grid. As we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of room to experiment with your column groupings. Here, uh, we've gone with a three-column uh, grouping. So uh, they kind of create homes for our information to live. When we apply our layout to the grid, you see that the grouping on the left has become our home for our navigation. In the middle, that uh, has become the home for our primary uh, 
information and our secondary information lives on the right. If we were to take this grid and apply it to the entire project, the user would be able to anticipate the visual rules that we've set up and know that the left is always for navigation, that the middle is always for our primary information. So even if they were to go to a new screen that they've never seen before, they'll uh, be able to anticipate how to use it. We've also taken the time to realign some of the elements on the screen. So on the, nav the navigation, it's all lined up and it's now seen as one group. And by carefully realigning some of the equipment elements, we've created these visual swim lanes where the user's eye can travel down more easily and find related information.